Allen show. Um, I, you know, I thought this was a good idea. And now, and I don't know if this is like British humor or whatever, but it seems like I have a lot, of, a lot at stake here, so I hope this goes okay. Um, what we did was we asked all of you to provide us with your questions through the talk at the state. And uh, we got a large number of questions in. We really appreciate that. And then what we did is we identified the most frequently asked questions, the ones that had the broadest appeal and the, and the major impact. So we provided those questions back to you on the meeting app. We came to 17 of them. And we asked each of you to pick the three that you most wanted us to answer. So then based on those votes, we're going to put them in descending order, and we're going to look to uh, answer those one at a time. And we'll see, we'll see how many we get to in the, in the allotted time. OK? So here we go. Here we go. The votes have been tabulated, and the question with the most interest is, Imagine that. There you go. All right, what is Rico's position on 3D printing? Well, that's an easy one to start, isn't it? Um, first of all, just so that you know these things, we have teleprompters in here, and I just want to make sure that any of you can come up and have a little look. We have the question on them, we don't have the answer. So, <laughs> this is uh, where we're not being spoon fed. Uh, so, first of all, 3D printing. When I, you know, I'm, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at this, and, and one of the things that I begin to realize that one of the few things that 3, 3D printing has in common with our business is the word printing. But other than that, there's not a lot. There's a lot of differences. So, you know, we are obviously spending time understanding what 3D printing is, and one of the things that the first thing that springs to mind for me is we went very early with Champs, as Jim said, we went out with a great PowerPoint. On 3D printing, we're ready now to go out with a great PowerPoint. And we're not ready for to do that. We do not want to do this because two things. We think there is a lot of, there's a lot of commonality of what 3D printing is to our business. So I joke about the printing. But there is a serious amount of difference. You need different people. You need different skill sets. You need to understand what is the customer going to do with 3D printing. Uh, Tim's going to talk a little bit about 3D printing tomorrow. We've got some very interesting examples of what's happening. So we want to launch something to you that is not going to disrupt your business. It's going to be something that's going to turn it into something that's a revenue positive, profit positive business to you. And we, quite frankly, don't know how to do that yet. Uh, we've got a number of ideas, and Rico's looking, you know, we're, do, we done, we're doing some things in Japan, we're doing some things in Europe, and we're doing some things behind the scenes here in 3D printing. But we're not ready to say, here's how to make money. Uh, here's how to go to the 3D printing. Is it a product that we can, can be carried by an existing sales force? Grave concerns that you give the sexy product to the new sales rep, and he'll go out and speak to all his customers about 3D printing, but he'll actually forget to sell our core business. And it's a core. So I think the answer is we will be in 3D printing, Jim. Um, but when we come out, we're going to come out with, we could sign up reseller agreements and do things like that, but that's not that's not challenging. How do we actually make money? We're all here to grow businesses, but grow businesses profitably. And I think we need to, uh, when we're ready, we'll come out, but we're not going to, you know, I, I still feel the pain of champs um, when we're not ready. So that's that's my thought. So yeah, I, you know, I think uh, echo Martin's comments. Uh, 3D printing, we've been involved with this for, for more than 15 years. So this isn't anything new to us, uh, and it is sexy, so it gets a lot of energy and a lot of press time. But we really want to understand how do we help our dealer community make money? How do we help our sales organizations in both direct and dealer really succeed with this and not complicate our current go-to-market strategy? So uh, that's really where our position is right now. But we do see it out there in the future as an opportunity, just figuring out what that opportunity is. And I have an old saying, and that is, if you want it bad, sometimes you get it bad. So. <laughs> I mean, I think there's... There's a lot of dealers, obviously, it was our number one question. There's a lot of dealers right now that have an obvious interest in it. Uh, some are already initiating relationships with third party OEMs. When you say we're going to be looking at it, we're going to be analyzing, what, what, kind of, what kind of time time are you looking at? I don't think, with, I think it's going to be longer than six months, but I think you know, we, need to, you know, we need to be ready. I think a big part of this is what's the support mechanism? You need to start having people with cabins, but. You need to start having people with material science or 
you know, it's a toy. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't make money out of toys. You've got to make this a, a viable, viable tool in your customers, uh, in your customers' work. So what are they going to do? That needs very different people to provide some support. So we've got some ideas and we're working, but I, I think, uh, I would say it'll be, it won't be in the next six months, but clearly, you know, if there's a market opportunity, we want to take it quickly rather than slow. And, you know, Rico's got a long head. We understand 3D print. We love to make a lot of the technology and the print head engines that go into 3D printers. But, um, you know, we do have, you know, working with Japan, they have a group, they're, they're calling it, you know, 3D printing's too obvious, so they're calling it additive materials group. Um, so, you know, we will be there, but uh, I would, you know, I think, again, let's not disrupt a business that's really going great for a market opportunity that may potentially, uh, you know, not generate significant revenue or profit in the short term. Okay, next question. What is Rico's position to support dealer growth despite reduction in page volume? Should I start that one again? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing is, you guys are selling so many more units that if your average unit, if your average page per, per unit is dropping down, you've got to outgrow the units and you're doing a fantastic job with that. So I think around the core business, you know, clearly there's an opportunity just to grow share. You know, so we have to, maybe the, the pages per device might be under pressure, but then let's go out grab devices. So we're going to continue the strategy to support you to grow your market share. But I think this just leads into champs and our whole services-led strategy, which is we have to bring more value to the customer. And I know many, you know, many dealers are doing lots of things yourselves to, to address that. And really, you know, we're making huge investments. Uh, in the whole service delivery organization, many of the marketing functions, strategic marketing. And so, you know, this is Champs. And, and, and you know, I'd be careful here just to point out that Champs does not just equal IT services. It means all of the resources of Rico. So we have to get stronger, wider, deeper in our customers. We, we need to assist you in how, you know, in, in how you can do that. So, but again, you know, let's, let's keep growing that market share. As the, that's, the, that's the first line of attack is to support them. Uh, on that, but the second one is, is champ. So. Yeah, I, I think you can't over or underestimate the, the investment that Rico has made uh, in our dealer partners. And particularly if you look over the last five years, the level of investment that we've made in men and women in this group is significant. When you've got price compression and you've got volume compression, uh, the easiest thing is to draw back. But we've actually, through the acquisition of Mindshift and through champs, and Mark said champs, tends to get wound up in the whole IT services discussion. But really what it is is taking the sunk cost of Rico, and Mark touched it on earlier, it created almost a sort of, we spend tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure and things, and how do we make them a sort of that supports both channels equally to allow us all to grow? And uh, the other piece that I think is critical here is nine years ago we weren't in production, and today we're Think about the volume growth that we've had in capturing the page volume in that area of the world. So I think the key here is we're in a very aggressive growth mode right now, and we're going to continue to be in that aggressive growth mode so that you're capturing share from your competitors and you're going wider and deeper in different areas and different revenue streams that you've never had before in your past to help offset this reality that's going on in the industry. And actually, as you go through the, uh, the expo, you're going to see a lot of other technology. Uh, you're going to see visual communications, digital signage, and those are all things, as you get deeper and deeper in understanding your customers' processes, their needs, um, these are also products that are, that are going to augment not only your revenues, uh, but just take you to a deeper level, level with your customers to secure them. Still, we get a plug in for Hide because Hide is responsible. I'm looking right at it. He's, all those video communication products. That's, his, uh, that's what Hide is going to be selling them in the hall in the Tech Expo. Uh, cut a deal with Hide, he'll, uh, he'll sell his product. Okay. okay, next question. Uh, when will Rico go to just one name? Rico. The question is when will Rico uh, Rico. Rico. Um, that's an easy one. Because the same answer this year as uh, when I first started asking, you know, when I came to the United States in 2008, I was asked, we were being asked this question. When is the right time to go? And so every year, you know, we are sitting talking with our, with our dealers, we're sitting looking internally. 
is it a sensible thing to go to one name? And right, every year up till now, and this year included, there's no compelling case to move to one name. We have phenomenal growth, as Jim mentioned earlier, savvy dealers, linear dealers, the success is tangible. And you know, we've I think everyone has realized that we've we've streamlined the support mechanism to make us much more effective. So the brand is now not get in the way of how Rico supports the dealer. It doesn't matter what brand you are, you're gonna get the same level of great support from Jim's team. So, you know, but we keep engaging you. So it's about it's about your, you, you certainly have a voice, whether it's through the NEC or just all of the feedback we get from the various channels. Um, so the answer will be when it makes sense to go to one night, but it won't be 2015. And, uh, you know, we'll see how we go. But, uh, you know, while we can keep growing all three channels, don't break, don't, you know, don't fix what ain't broken. Yeah, I think it's important now that more than 50% of our dealers are not ready for money. So that, that's a big change. And, and you saw on the screen earlier today, I mean, how many dealers, like you, you guys are pillars in your community where you've been there for 20, 30, 40 years under a certain brand name uh, are operating and selling the Rico brand name. So uh, that's not a, a decision that we would take lightly. It's, it's, it's one that um, we're very pleased with the way we go to market today. Dave's roots are in the near. And, uh, My brand's gone. What's that? My brand's gone. I can't believe you maybe even have to mention <laughs> But uh, actually, there's a Lanier dealer, Dave, that's been a Lanier dealer for 60 years. Do you know who that is? If you're on air time, I'll give you a chip. <laughs> no, it's uh, Coke Brothers. Oh, been, right. been a Lanier dealer for 60 years. All right, we'll beat that one to death. Uh, next one. Huh. What is, oh, it's Am I allowed to ask Dennis to come up? <laughs> no, that's, I didn't say we promised we wouldn't. What is Rico doing to improve order, order fulfillment for equipment and parts? Um, I, I think we both covered this a little bit in the general session, so, you know, I, I don't, I have a fear of repeating myself. Um, this is not just, first of all, I shared that this is a, this is a question that I get from every direct sales office of what we do. So this is not a dealer problem. And Dave might talk a little bit about how, the, how we deal with the dealer and the direct channels here. But, you know, we have, this is our number one problem. This is this from a back office problem we have to deal with that. So everything I said about, you know, it sounds like it's useful, but we, we have so much of a visibility to what the problem is now, that I think we're in the best position to start changing that. But I think we have to be much more open so listening to your perspective of what you see. I mean, these things sound silly, um, but you know, I know you know you all uh, you all manage your businesses. We've been, in, you know, one of the things in hindsight, we were managing to move in averages. But in a company our size, if you move an average, you can still have 20% of the transactions being horribly outside the acceptable time frame. So now we're we're really resetting on what is an acceptable window and how do we drive that. So. You know, I just have to sit there and say, this is, uh, you know, if you were to ask me what is the thing that, you know, from an internal perspective that we can control, this is something that is very serious. And I think the other side of this is, you know, we certainly have a lot of areas where we can improve in the Americas, but we've also got to, you know, with the technology available today, whether it's, you know, big data or system speed with each other, we have to get tighter with them all the way up the manufacturing chain right to the beginning of buying components in a factory. Um, and, you know, I would say that the, this is shared by uh, the executives in Japan, both on the corporate side, but also in the, the manufacturing side, so. You know, the one thing I want to add, and let's stop with this side of this, because some of this is a growth problem. We've had, we've had record growth in our dealer community for three years, and we've got great growth in our direct uh, business, which it doesn't make the problem go away, but it actually enhances the problem. And our commitment is to fix this issue. And uh, just let me add this, and, and uh, we have many of our direct vice presidents in the room here, and they support this strategy, and they understand this strategy. But when it comes to order fulfillment and parts, uh, we put the dealers at the top priority with those uh, when we start getting thin on inventory to protect our dealers first, because you need to understand something that you all in this room 
are our biggest customer and our most important customer. And that's how we balance the channels uh, so that we know that we can help you fulfill first uh, and, and hold fresh uh, uh, back just a little bit on that. A couple of our global accounts might sneak in before yeah. we talk, but in general, you're, re you're right up at the top priority. <laughs> Um, Andy, did yeah. you videotape that, what he just said? Got it. Good. Yeah, that's what it's well, the news on that is, whether it was videotaped or not, that is actually a clear message to the director. Yeah. And they understand. Yeah. They understand and they support. And, and I think one of the biggest changes in the last five years, or really even longer, is the understanding of the direct organization and how important our dealer partners are to the overall success. If you, if you go back in time five years ago, we had really two separate organizations that were, uh, you know, really a constant conflict. And, and think in these terms, we have the largest dealer, if you look at quality dealer, and metrics around quality dealer, dealer organization in, in our industry here in the United States, and we have by far the largest direct footprint in the United States. How do we make those work together? Well, the first piece was making sure the direct organization understand just how important everyone is in here. And I think the level of communication and it was brought up in several videos. Uh, hey, I, now I know my local direct guy and my direct guy knows my local dealer guy. And we're able to collaborate and get things done. And that's really awesome to look at how uh, we've taken off the chance is uh, another my part. Good. Next question, please. <laughs> Will Rico, yeah. Will Rico sell any more MIF to dealers? I guess it's Dave's direct bit, so I guess. Yeah, well, just that one that way. Well, let's see. Last night I was asked this 58 times. <laughs> I think you had a few offers. Didn't you? Yeah, I probably had a few offers. Um, you know, if you think about it, this is, this is a pretty interesting concept. Uh, we as a manufacturer were the first ones to step out and do that. Um, and if you really think about it, it's how much, how much trust we have in our new organization to do this. But I, I also got to give you the short answer right now, and that is, Currently, we don't have anything of material size out there that we're looking to sell or transfer. And I'll tell you why. One, very first, these are, these are complex transactions. And they sound very simple. We just go ahead and take this marketplace, close it down, and move it over to the dealer. But our third party leasing partners make this very difficult to pull off. Uh, it's just a lot of strings attached to that. That's number one. Number two, our global account and national accounts have very specific SLAs that we, we need to meet. Now, our dealers do a great job in servicing those, but thinking these terms, all of a sudden, you've got that data now inside your system. How do we get that data out of your system into our system and report it back to the dealer? So that, I mean, to the, the uh, company, the, the Fortune 500 company. So that's a very you know, clunky move that we have to work through. And lastly, then we have to explain to our customers um, why are we doing this. But, with that said, I've, I've sat on the stage uh, many years now, so we have a market-by-market market strategy where we look at, you know, dealer-by-dealer, dealer, brand by brand, dealer versus direct, and how we maximize uh, market share. And so the point there is never say never, uh, but it is uh, just a little more difficult than one might manage to do. A lot of these questions, what we did is <clears throat> brought together different questions to create the same topic. And some other questions that were kind of associated with this one is there's a number of dealers that are asking about when they do acquisitions, which is obviously a big, uh, you know, it's happening qu quite often. What's Rico's appetite for working with them, supporting them on, uh, you know, transitioning to MIF and, and what helping with, uh, with financial support? Well, so I'll take that. I mean, clearly, there's, only, there's two scenarios when, when you're acquiring another dealer. Either it's a fellow RFG dealer or it's a competitive dealer. So in both cases, those are good for us. So we want to make sure an RFG dealer stays in the RFG fam uh, family if the, the owners have decided that it's time to, to sell the business and move on. Uh, and clearly if we buy a competitive uh, dealer, then it's an opportunity to you know, capture market share, take myth and convert that myth. So both of those are a good transaction so nothing, no deal is, is ever the same. But you know, I bring this straight back to how does Rico make its assets, all of its assets, work for the dealers. So if part of that is our balance sheet, and we can help in terms of myth conversion or some other way, 
we absolutely want to talk to you. Now, we're not going to sort of lend you 100% of the purchase price with no conditions. I mean, it has to be a sensible business transaction. But in general, this is a good thing for us. So anything we can do to make those transactions happen, uh, I'm all for it. That gives me a little more to work with. <clears throat> when I get the question, I can just say, yeah. <laughs> But we've, I mean, we've got one or two right now that we're having some serious discussions on how we can support. We've supported a few in the past, and there's easy ways and there's less easy ways. But, you know, I, I, this is a good thing for us to grow share as a manufacturer. So if we can help, we'd like to be, uh, we'd like to be involved. Okay, next question. <clears throat> what is the plan for Rico to offer mind shift to dealers? Right, that's got your name all over it. It's, it's me. It's you. It's your dealers. What do you do? I clear my throat. <clears> you <throat> woke up with a cold this morning. I never did say I wake up this morning, I went to call for coffee, and I was like, whose voice was that? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we're, we're 